A question was asked by Judge Webel just before the break to Mr. Bourne, with uh, possibility, of course, for the government to answer it if they want. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, turning to the relevant paragraph, which is 33 of Zachariah Thames' um, witness statement, which um, was read out. The question is, what was the thesis of that paragraph and what factual inferences might be drawn from it? The thesis we would submit um, is almost identical to the government's legal case. Um, and one can surmise how the government's legal case found its way into Mr. Atem's statement. That legal case, of course, is that the ABA area is defined as a transferred area that lay to the south of what the government takes to be the Kordofan Bar al Ghazal boundary in 1905, what they call the Bar al Arab or the Kir Bar al Arab, and that the transferred area can only be that area to the south of the Kir. Um, the thesis as well, and this is going to take me some time, I think, to work through in Atem's statement, is that that was by no means all of the Nakdinka territory, um, which instead, for reasons that I've already explained today at some length, extended substantially to the north above the Kir Bar al Arab, above the Nagol, and that not just the SPLMA, but indeed Mr. Atem himself thought that that was unfair. He draws a conclusion from that in paragraph 33 that it caused political difficulties for the SPLM because when they realized, in effect, in his view, the government's legal view, that they had given up their traditional um, ancestral homelands to the north of the Kir Bar al Arab, people were angry with them. That is what I would submit quite clearly is uh, the thesis of uh, Tam's witness statement. I'd like you to take you to um, paragraph 23 of his witness statement. And we can look there um, at how that thesis is elaborated. He says in paragraph 23, before the 1965 conflict, the Nakh lived around Abye, was some to the north and west and some to the east. All nine chiefdoms were intermingling. There were no boundaries among them either. Their settlements were in Tigai, Dawa, Santila, the Ragab, Zarga, and Fawel. And then he goes on. And I'd just like to pause there. That is um, a substantial chunk of the bar. He doesn't describe exactly how much of the bar is, but it's clear um, it's a big chunk. Um, and um, it goes up beyond what we've called the Nagol, the Ragab, Ez Zarga. Um, in Atem's words, the government's witness's words. And he then goes on in that paragraph and also in paragraphs 25 and 26 to describe why that is. And I think it's helpful to look at why that is because it um, coincides very nicely with the government's other witness, Professor Kunison, who wasn't able to be here. Um, he says, and this is in the next sentence in paragraph 23, the area to the north of Abiye is good for cattle grazing and, and then I'd like to read this, this word with some emphasis, has always been the grazing for my subsection, always. Um, and he goes on in paragraph 25 to say, beginning in October, the Miseria migrate south of Abiye where they stay for the entire summer period until the first rains when they return. The reason for this is that the Miseria cattle are sensitive to flies, and we've seen that referred to before in the record. The Nakdinka build luwaks for the rainy season, and our cattle can survive the flies. And I'd like to take us back to the description of the bar region, the environmental evidence which we put in and which is uncontroverted. Atem here affirms that in terms. Um, he explains how it is that the Nak can survive throughout the bar region, which we looked at, where there is the seasonal flooding and when there, where there are the flies. They build luwaks and they have the short-legged, non-humped non cattle, which are able to survive in that area. And then he gives another reason that I, I was a little bit embarrassed, frankly, that I hadn't 
made this in my presentation, but he goes on in 26 to say, if the Nakdinka wishes to take his cattle into a miseria area, he is not per- permitted, prohibited, excuse me. And that, of course, is above the gauze. He says, but he does not need that. He doesn't need to go up into the dry areas above the gauze. Um, uh, I've lost my place. Because he has luox for his cows. He doesn't need to go north to where there aren't rains because he's built luox. However, grazing to the north of our normal areas is unsuitable for our cattle. The grass there, called lisag, makes our cattle sick. The miseria cattle are used to it, and the people have methods for treating the symptoms of that we knock dinka do not know. And I'll come back in closing and explain to you what lisag is. You won't be surprised, though, when I tell you now that lisag is a grass that grows in sandy areas. It doesn't grow in the gauze. It grows up in the north. And I'd finally like to take you to paragraph 28. And if you look, he gives it an explanation, which not surprisingly coincides with the government's legal thesis. And then in the second to last last sentence, he says, and he's describing the ABA area in accordance with the government's case. He says, this clearly excludes area of Knox settlements which were in Kordofan before the transfer. And so here he's referring to the areas north of the Barla Rab which were in Kordofan before the transfer and which caused, from his perspective, the political problems. This was the area to the north of the Kir which supposedly got given away. The important thing, the important factual inferences to draw from this is that the government's witness, Zachariah Tim, who they brought here, in his witness statement does two important things. He describes how the traditional Nak territories extended well north of the Kir Barla Rab, up to and beyond the Nagol Ragaba Ezarga. He, we, we saw him. Um, he's not a scientist, but he can tell us about the area. And he told us why that would be the case. He told us about the luags. He told us about the flies. He told us about the rains. And he told us something we didn't even know about the Lissag graph. And the last thing that he said isn't in his statement, but I'd like to read from page 2046 um, um, at the top, lines 1 through seven of his witness statement in response to to questions from the tribunal. He said, in reference to the ABA area, um, Danforth said that this is the place where the Dinka have been transferred, but this is a small triangle. This is in reference to what he took to be the transferred area thesis beneath the Kier. This is a small triangle, so that it is not enough to accommodate even the owners of the area. That takes us back to what I told you about the government's theory that you really need high-rise condominiums in the 14-mile swampland underneath the Kier to accommodate all the Nakdinka that would need to live there. There's not enough room there, Mr. Atem told us. It is not enough to accommodate even the owners of the area. And then he went on and said, and this is very important, So, as a Dinka tribe member, I think that this is unfair because the Dinka used to extend from the south, from the north, and to the south as well. And what he tells you there is if you accept the government's legal theory, which he has had put in his statement, it is in his view unfair because it takes away from the Nak Dinka their traditional lands. The good news is it isn't unfair. The good news is we've seen it before. We're going to hear it again. The legal formula in Article 1.1.2 of the ABA area does not adopt the bizarre interpretation that the government has put. Instead, the experts got it exactly right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you very much. Does the government want to answer the question raised by Judge Schwebel? Most certainly, yes, sir. It's It's an important question. And we would, as a matter of courtesy, have answered in any event. Um, However, I have to say that we've now had what amounted to a 10-minute speech going somewhat beyond the implications of the question, and I reserve the right to come back tomorrow in my discussion of the Travo Preparatoire of the ABO Protocol to deal further with the implications of what counsel for the SPLMA have just said. The first point I would make is the whole of that statement was Mr. Zachariah's testimony and not just the bits that suit counsel for the SPLMA. 
it's obvious if you read our witness statements that they're not completely consistent with each other. Uh, the reason for that is that there are different views held amongst the various people who gave witness statements and we didn't try and homogenize them. Um, it's clear that Mr. Zachariah, as a member, as a respected elder member of the Nyok community, takes a broader view of the extent of historical Nyok lands than the government does. That's his prerogative. But he also takes a view, which is his own view, as I understand it, that the Danforth Compromise involved a territorial transfer to Cordofan. It's not a very surprising view because that's what it says. And he expresses the corollary of that, that when that compromise was reached after intensive and lengthy negotiations, as I said in my first speech, there was considerable disquiet amongst the Nyok community uh, as to the implications for them, as well there might have been. That was the agreement was reached by the SPLMA and not by the Nyok. And that gave rise to disquiet. That's what he's saying. What its implications are for this tribunal, of course, is unfathomable. But, uh, uh, the government affirms the truth of what he's saying in the paragraph to which you refer. And in the context of a testimony that he gave, allowed him to say what he actually thought on all fronts. Thank you, sir. I thank you very much. We are now to begin the second round of replies, this time on the delimitation issue. I recall that each side will have 80 minutes and the government begins. Please, Mr. Pante, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, distinguished members of the tribunal. I shall begin the government's reply to the SPLMA's first round pleading on the question, what was the area of the nine Nock Dinka chiefdoms transferred to Kordofan in 1905? And I'll be followed by Professor Crawford, who will discuss the SPLMA's tribal case. Now, we've heard two very different accounts of what happened at the time. The SPLMA has painted a picture of confusion, ignorance, uncertainty in the minds of condominium officials as to the area that was transferred from Baja Ghazal to Kordofan in 1905 and the people of that area. According to our opponents, there was no provincial boundary between the two provinces at the time. That, as you'll recall from this morning, was the principal conclusion of Minas. No provincial boundary. The location of the pre-transfer boundary and the post-transfer boundary is thus irrelevant to your task. That was repeated by Mr. Bourne on Sunday. Boundaries had not been established pursuant to any decree or proclamation, a point raised by Professor Daly. There was no administration on the ground, a point also raised by Professor Daly this morning. No one knew for sure which river was which, where the rivers lay, a theme that permeates the SPLMA's pleadings. And that the Governor General's views that the districts transferred that were formerly part of the Bahal Ghazal province and that lay to the south of the Bahal Arab that those were incorporated into Kordofan should be disregarded, which is precisely what the SPLMA's memorial and counter-memorial did, along with the Minas report and the first daily report. They also say that condominium officials had little idea where the Nakdinka were really located. That's from paragraph 114 of their rejoinder. Now, on that last point, Mr. President, I need to interject a brief comment. Uh, yesterday afternoon, Mr. Bourne purported to quote something that I said yesterday morning in my first round presentation. Page 183 of the transcript, counsel said that I said, and I quote, it is self-evident that as of 1905, government officials would have had no knowledge of tribal locations. 
That's what counsel said that I said. That I would have no knowledge of tribal, that, uh, that as of 1905, government officials would have no knowledge of tribal locations. Now, you know, as an advocate, I can certainly have no objection if opposing counsel tries to cite my words against me. But when he does so, I'd prefer it if he could quote me correctly. I did not say that it's self-evident that as of 1905, government officials would have had no knowledge of tribal locations. If one checks the actual transcript at page 20, Mr. Bourne's reference to the transcript was incorrect, but if one checks the actual transcript, it will be seen that what I actually said was, and I quote, it is self-evident that as of 1905, government officials would have no knowledge of tribal locations or other factors that only emerged after that date. Or only emerged after that date. By dropping the final words that I said, counsel seriously distorted my point. And as both Professor Crawford and I have showed, by 1905, condominium officials did have a good idea of where the knock Dinka were located and of the area that was transferred in that year. Now the litany of points of confusion, lack of knowledge, and uncertainty posited by our opponents brings at least to my mind the eloquent words of Yeats in his poem, The Second Coming. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. It's a moving verse, but it's not the way condominium officials viewed the situation at the time. The transfer decision was not controversial in 1905, and it was not complicated. Condominium officials had a well-articulated intention. There had been complaints from Sultan Rob and Sheikh Rehan of raids of Bagara Arabs living in Kordofan on Dinkas living in Baha Ghazal. It was thought that this situation could be better controlled if the territories, those territories of the Nak Dinka and the Twitch, those territories situated in the Baha Ghazal province at the time were transferred to Kordofan so that all the protagonists would be under the same administrative authority of the governor of Kordofan. There was no dispute in 1905 over these issues. Condominium officials were not trying to settle a territorial dispute where different positions had been advanced. No one was posturing for litigation purposes. All that was involved was a straightforward administrative transfer of an area from one province to another. It did not involve large-scale change to Sudan's provincial boundaries. Relatively limited, though nonetheless important, areas were at stake. This was not a complex matter for condominium administrators in 1905, and we would submit that it does not need to be a complicated task for this tribunal either. The pieces of the documentary re record fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. They add up. And the essential task for this tribunal we would respectfully submit is to examine that record as a whole in assessing the party's positions. Does it really support the proposition that condominium officials in 1905 intended to transfer from Baha Ghazal to Kordofan areas that extended up to the 1035 north latitude or even the 102230 north latitude? Is that what the record really shows? Or does the record support the proposition that the transferred area was viewed by condominium officials themselves as much more limited and as lying along the Bahal Arab and to its south. Unlike many boundary disputes dating from more than a century ago, the basic facts relating to the transfer, 
and the evidence of the intention of government officials who effectuated the transfer are well documented. Despite Council's complaint that there are only two dozen or so documents referring to the Nacht, Dinka, or Miseria from the time, the fact is that we have numerous intelligence reports prepared on a monthly basis, annual reports for the relevant provinces of Baja Ghazal and Kordofan for each of the significant years, very detailed accounts from government officials who visited the area, including with their sketch maps, and the views of the senior most government administrator, which he recorded contemporaneously and which referred specifically to the transfer and its location. It's a rich and informative body of documentary evidence. We know what happened at the time because the relevant documents are on the record. The fact that the ABC experts did not refer to much of this record does not diminish its importance, although it may say something about the ABC's work. The center does indeed hold. Nothing falls apart. Perhaps, if I may be permitted to say so, this tribunal is, in a very real sense, the second coming when compared to the ABC experts' report. Now, we've been told by the SPLMA not to second-guess or rewrite, rewrite what government administrators wrote at the time, and that the most reliable approach is to look at what government administrators said they transferred to Kordofan in 1905. The SPLMA memorial, in fact, at paragraph 1579, called the 1905 condominium official documentary records decisive, decisive, precisely. And we encourage the tribunal to take that approach. Yet yesterday afternoon, counsel for the SPLMA took exactly the opposite approach. He now emphasizes that the documentary evidence should be looked at with skepticism because of its so-called limitations. From what we heard for a good part of yesterday afternoon, what is more important is to look at what condominium officials did not say rather than what they said. And the tribunal is invited to play detective and speculate as to the alleged missing gaps. In short, it turns out that we should second-guess the condominium officials after all. And today, we've actually heard virtually no discussion whatsoever of the documents that the SPLMA previously said were decisive. There's been no mention today, for example, of the March 1905 Sudan Intelligence Report. No mention of the 1905 annual reports. These were documents that even Professor Daly in his first report termed foundation texts, and yet he couldn't even remember the annual reports in questions put to him this morning. And we also have had a passing by Mr. Schofield, my good friend and colleague, a passing reference to Wingate's memorandum but nothing at all focusing on what Wingate actually said about the transferred area. And that was the passage we all recall where Wingate said that the transferred area comprised the districts of the two sultans to the south of the Bahal Arab and formerly a portion of Bahal Ghazal province that had been incorporated into Kordofan. In considering the evidence, it's perfectly clear that government administrators were not relying on oral tradition or on post-1905 events when they described the transferred area. Nor did they feel that they needed to know where all the Nak, uh, where the areas were that all the areas that the Nak Dinka allegedly occupied or used. They didn't need to know, and they weren't interested in connection with the transfer with climactic conditions, soil, vegetation, and other 
environmental elements. They weren't interested in those, and those did not figure into their decision and their description of the transfer. Condominium officials make no mention of these kinds of factors in relation to the transfer decision, and indeed, Professor Allen confirmed in a response to a question put to him that there's no document evidencing that condominium officials considered these kinds of environmental factors relevant at all to the transfer decision or to their description of the transferred area. Those officials were focused on a much more limited exercise, transferring the districts, the areas, the territories, the country, those are the terms that are used, of two type tribal chiefs previously located in Baja Ghazal to Kordofan. The location of the transferred area must be viewed in the light of the object and purpose behind the transfer. That purpose was only to transfer an area that was previously in Baja Ghazal province to Kordofan so that the area would be placed under the same administration. And the only areas transferred were those necessary to fulfill that purpose, i.e., areas that previously had been in Baja Ghazal. People already living in Kordofan did not need to be transferred to Kordofan. On Sunday, counsel for the SPLMA said that the decisive issue for the ABC experts was to locate the extent of the territory of the nine Nok Dinka chiefdoms as they stood in 1905 not the location of putative provincial boundaries. Now, I don't intend to return to the question put to the ABC experts. It's possible that Professor Crawford may in closing tomorrow, but I, what I would say is that that formula, simply the extent of the territory of the nine Nok Dinka chiefdoms as it stood in 1905, is most certainly not a correct description of this tribunal's delimitation mandate. The words transferred to Kordofan cannot simply be suppressed as council does, and that is certainly not the way that condominium officials in 1905 viewed the situation. Officers such as Wilkinson, Percival, and Bailden were not dispatched to investigate the location of areas occupied or used by the Nok Dinka. Bailden, as we know, was sent with very different instructions, specifically to explore the relevant rivers, which was the primary interest of government officials. Contrary to the submissions of our opponents, Bailden was in the relevant area. It was Bailden who was the one that Sheikh Rehan of the Twitch had complained to, as reported in the, 19, the February 1905 intelligence report about raiding. Bailden was the one in fact, the only one who explored the Ragaba Zerga in any details. He went up 40 miles. And he'd also been engaged, obviously, on the Bahal Arab, the real Bahal Arab. What is clear is there's not a single record, a single document on the record. There's not one suggesting that the transfer decision was motivated by and contingent on identifying the extent of the territory occupied or used by the Nok Dinka in 1905. Condominium officials were simply not concerned with that issue. They were solely concerned with the transfer of an area from one province to another to control raiding in areas that formerly had formed part of the province of Baha Ghazal. And to accomplish that task, they were only concerned with the Nok Dinka and Twitch areas situated in Baja Ghazal since it was only this area that would be transferred. As I said, areas or even people already in Kordofan did not need to be transferred to Kordofan in order to achieve the object and purpose of the transfer. Hence, Wingate's description in his 1905 memorandum that it's the districts of the two sultans to the south of Baja Arab and formerly in the Baha Ghazal province that have been transferred to Kordofan. 
nor were colonial administrators trying to divide up the gauze or to allocate permanent or secondary grazing rights in an equitable manner or to apply African principles of law. The tribunal will search the record in vain for any trace of evidence that these kinds of considerations were in the minds of condominium administrators when they carried out and when they reported on the transfer. Such concepts were utterly alien to the whole raison d'etre underlying the transfer decision. Let me return to the actual, actual transfer documents, despite the fact that they've been virtually ignored by our opponents in their first round, pre first round presentation. But what did they tell us was the condominium's contemporary understanding of what they were doing and which areas they considered they were transferring. Surprisingly, the March 1905 Sudan Intelligence Report, first reporting on the transfer, has not, at least as far as I'm aware, been even referred to by our colleagues in the delimitation phase of these proceedings. Even to the extent it referred to Sultan Rob's or Sultan Twitch's people, and it's not clear that people are, is in the large sense or just referring to Sultan Rob and Sultan Rehan, but even if it referred to Sultan Rob's people, those people had a country. And the Sudan intelligence report, the March 1905 intelligence report, clearly states that the country of Sultan Rob is on the Kir. There's never been any confusion about where the Kir was. It didn't say his country was on the Ragabazerga or the Bahal Hamra further north. It said it was on the Kir. Then, of course, we have, as I've explained, Governor General Wingate's description of the transfer area. Now, on Monday, counsel for the SPLMA asserted and this is the transcript at page 90, that condominium officials had no idea of what the territorial boundaries of the thing that they would have been transferring was. Well, that's certainly not the case for Governor General Wingate. He had a very good idea of the thing. It wasn't a thing. It was two districts that was being transferred to the south of the Bahalara. And it can't be disputed that Wingate was the most senior official in the Sudan. Let me just recall how Professor Daly has described him. His power was absolute. He was a virtual dictator. He had the supreme, the supreme military and civil command in Sudan was vested in him. And lastly, the governor general of the Sudan in Khartoum, and I quote, was the only official who mattered. The only official who mattered. That's in Professor Daly's second report at page 19. Wingate was not thus merely some administrative official, as was intimated by the SPLMA's presentation the other day. He was the only official that mattered. Moreover, he was interested in where the relevant rivers lay. As his 1904 memorandum in the annual report for that year clearly shows, and even Professor Daly acknowledged this this morning. Now, previously, in Professor Daly's written statements, he had said quite categorically that the hydrology of the region we're concerned of was of little or no concern to condominium officials in 1905. This morning, he said, and I quote, there was certainly an interest. It's been suggested in the Minas report, although not repeated in testimony this morning, that Bailden's 1905 report, uh, March 1905 report, where he correctly identified the Bahalarab River, would have been kept secret for months and even years. Now, that is pure speculation, but I'd note that if that was the case, then the transfer decision, which was reported in the same intelligence report, would have been kept secret for months and for years as well, and we know but that is not the case for either of those. Wingate knew about the transfer, and Wingate knew about Bailden's 1905 explorations. 
as well as those subsequently carried out in the same year by Slepini and Walsh. We know that because he referred to these in his 1905 memorandum. And yet, as is clear from the submissions of the other side, either by omission or by denigration, the description of the only official who mattered, his description of the transferred area, should be given no weight. And once again, I'd respectfully ask which party is now trying to rewrite or second guess what condominium officials said. I turn to a related issue which concerns the relevance of the provincial boundary. It's obviously another issue on which the parties remain divided. The SPLM argues that the location of the provincial boundary is irrelevant to the question posed. We say it's not. Indeed, we believe an assessment of the northern limits of the transferred area is inextricably linked to the question of the provincial boundary, and it's linked both before and after the transfer, and that that is how condominium officials at the time viewed the situation. As I've already noted in my first round presentation, three of the four trans, uh, transfer documents, three of the four documents from 1905 specifically referring to the transfer do so under headings, rubric, dealing with provincial boundaries and changes to provincial boundaries. In contrast, we have the SPLMA's complaint, repeated by their expert, that there was no administration to speak of in the area in question, and that therefore the very existence of a provincial boundary was inconsequential. And we would respectfully suggest that that line of argument is ill-founded on a number of grounds, both legal and factual. Let me start with the legal. As was pointed out as far back as the Island of Palmas case, but it's a passage that has been cited with approval in the court's recent case in Singapore, Malaysia, state authority should not necessarily be displayed in fact at every moment or every point of territory. And as Max Huber stated in his award, and I quote, in the exercise of territorial sovereignty, there are necessarily gaps intermittence in time and discontinuity in space. The fact that a state cannot prove display of sovereignty as regards such a portion of territory cannot forthwith be interpreted as showing, as showing that sovereignty is inexistent. Each case must be appreciated in accordance with the particular circumstances. And we submit that these same considerations apply to administrative boundaries displays of sovereignty or of administration vary according to the nature of the territory being administered. When territory is relatively remote, a display of modest amounts of administration does not imply that a province is not administered as a unit or that provincial boundaries do not exist or were not deemed to be important. Factually, we know that Sultan Rob was given a robe of honor. It's actually reported in gazetted documents that the SPLMA is so fond of, an administrative act. We know that both he and Sheikh Rehan approached the government to control raiding. We know that the government responded. And we know that one of the responses was the transfer, and that transfer decision was quintessentially an administrative Act. Now, Minas's primary conclusion, which I can only assume that the SPLMA shares, is that in 1905 there existed no provincial boundary between the two provinces. And this morning, Professor Daly asserted that in Wingate's cover letter, he called Wingate's memorandum Wingate's cover letter, in his cover letter, and I quote, there was, well, in, in speaking of Wingate's cover letter, he, quote, he said there was nothing in there about a provincial boundary. Now, we disagree with that, and based on 
condominium accounts and contemporary accounts of the situation, it's quite clear that the government officials of the day did not share that view either. Certainly, as Professor Allen confirmed yesterday, there's no document that can be pointed to referenced during the relevant period in which condominium officials said there was no provincial boundary. In fact, quite the opposite is the case. And frankly, I cannot see, Mr. President and members of the Tribunal, how, when the pre-transfer annual reports for the two provinces contain a specific section entitled Province Boundaries, these are the ones that Professor Daly could not re recall this morning, and when they state that the boundary is the Bahal Arab, and when Wingate makes reference to the changes in that boundary brought about by the transfer, and when he discusses the transfer under a section of his memorandum or covering letter, if you prefer, entitled in bold type, Changes to Provincial Boundaries and Nomenclature, I do not see in the light of those materials that it can be maintained that there existed no provincial boundary or that such a boundary was in irrelevant to the transfer or to an assessment of where the transferred area lay. But there's a further point. If in 1905, just before the transfer, there really had been no provincial boundary between the two provinces, then why would there have been a need for a transfer in the first place from one province to another? If you haven't got a pro provincial boundary, why do you need a transfer from one province to another province? In a situation where there are no provincial boundaries, it would have been meaningless to carry out an administrative act the sole purpose of which was to transfer the districts of two sultans from the administration of Baha Ghazal to that of Kordofan in order to place them under the same governor. Condominium officials would not have needed a transfer if there was no provincial boundary. It's precisely because the districts of the two sultans, as so clearly shown in Wingate's memorandum, had formally been situated in the province of Baha Ghazal, that they were incorporated in the transfer in, into Kordofan. And it's why he discusses it under the heading changes in boundaries, and it's one of his principal changes. As I noted in my first net round presentation, when the Baha'l Arab, oh, excuse me, Now, it's true that prior to 1905, there were large par portions of the Baha'l Arab that remained unexplored. But condominium officials knew that. That was the whole reason why Lieutenant Bailden was sent to explore the river at the end of 1904. Nonetheless, the condominium officials were aware that areas remained unexplo uh, unexplored, but that did not prevent them from still considering the Baha'l Arab to constitute the provincial boundary between the two provinces, just as it was the provincial boundary further west between Baha Ghazal and Darfur, a boundary which cannot be questioned. There's no, first of all, rivers can and do represent administrative boundaries and even international boundaries, and there is no general principle of law that requires rivers to be surveyed in their entirety to be considered delimited administrative or international boundaries. And I would suggest that the Honduras-El Salvador case to which I've made reference before supports that proposition. Now, when the Baha'l Arab was correctly identified by Bailden in March 1905 and later referred to by Wingate in his memorandum, there was no suggestion that that river was somehow no longer thought to have been the pre-transfer boundary. Why else would Wingate, under his section entitled Principal Changes to, the, Changes to the Provincial Boundaries, state that the two districts of the Sultans, south of the Bahal Arab, had formerly part, been part of Baha Ghazal province and that they were being transferred? That necessarily implies that the Bahal Arab the Bahal Arab he had referred to in his long page at page 11 as where Bailden, Walsh, and Slipini were carrying out their operations. 
That implies that that Bahal Arab had been the pre-transfer boundary. We have, in short, four key factors relating to the provincial boundary. Prior to 1905, it was expressly recorded in the annual reports for both provinces that the provincial boundary was the Bahal Arab. Not the putative Bahal Arab, the Bahal Arab. Not a parallel of latitude, the Bahal Arab. That was the case for the Kordofan Baha Ghazal boundary, and it was equally the case for the Darfur Baha Ghazal boundary. It was the only river in this area that fit that description going east to west from Darfur to its origins in the east, surveyed by Saunders and Peake. Secondly, we have the 1905 annual reports. They show the description of the provincial boundary changes. And instead of referring to the Bahal Arab now as the provincial boundary, they record the transfer. Those are foundation texts that we should pay close attention to. Essential is the word the SPLM uses. We then have Wingate's memorandum talking about the transfer in connection with the provincial boundaries. And we have, after the transfer, the new provincial boundary, not fully delimited because the southern area of the transferred districts had not been precisely identified. It did not necessarily follow a river like the northern limits that were transferred. But you have the new southern boundary, the new Kordofan, Baja Ghazal provincial boundary, starting to be shown on maps like the Lloyd map I projected in the whole series of sheet 65 maps that are in the record. And that's the boundary that ultimately becomes the 1956 boundary on independence. And that is why, for example, the 1911 Anglo-Egyptian Sudan Handbook, when it describes the northern boundaries of Bahal Ghazal province, states as follows, and I quote, the actual boundary line is not yet delimited, but it follows the course of the Bahal Arab or Regazat from the Nile Congo watershed, that's Darfur, until the frontier of Kordofan is reached when the boundary divides certain tribal districts to Lake No. Previously, in 1903, the boundary had been the Bahal Arab to Lake No. Now it's saying the boundary divides certain tribal districts. That was because of the transfer. The southern limits had not been precisely identified, but the northern limits were. So in conclusion, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, the government of Sudan submits that when the documents are looked at as a whole, the documents that shed light and evidence what condominium officials intended with respect to the 1905 transfer and the location of the transferred area, the following conclusions emerged. First, there was a clear purpose behind the transfer. Second, that purpose was to transfer areas belonging to the two sultans and necessarily the people living in those areas or districts that formerly had been situated in the province of Baha Ghazal to the province of Kordofan so that such areas would be under the administration of the same provincial governor, the governor of Kordofan. Third, there was no need and no intention to transfer anything that was already in Kordofan before 1905. That would have been meaningless. Fourth, the transferred area as described by Wingate is consistent with the fact that the March 1905 intelligence report situates Sultan Rob's country on the Kir, as to which there's no dispute, and Sheikh Rehan's between the Kir and the Lowell. And the Percival and Wilkinson sketches show Sultan Rob's territory, a great swath of it, lying to the south, particularly in the Percival sketch, to the south of the Kir. Next, the transfer decision was obviously related to the location of the provincial boundary. Had there been no such boundary, there would not have been any areas which could have been said to have been in the province of Baja Ghazal that needed to be transferred to Kordofan. Sixth, the transfer documents, the so-called foundation texts, the decisive documents, according to the other side, refer to the transfer in connection with the provincial boundary and the change in that boundary that the transfer gave rise to. 
1977. Wingate's memorandum, Wingate, the only official who mattered, bears this out. His memorandum also provides the clearest and the best description of the location of the transferred area, the area of the two sultans situated to the south of the Bahal Arab that had formerly been in Baha Ghazal province. Eighth, that is why the post-1905 provincial boundary changes and is situated on maps to the south of the Bahal Arab. And finally, our conclusion on this is that it follows that the transferred area in 1905 that was intended and carried out by condominium officials was the area between the Bahal Arab and the new provincial boundary further south. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the tribunal. I'd be grateful if you could now call on Professor Crawford. I thank you, Mr. Bundy, and I give the floor to Professor Crawford. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, Mr. Bourne's presentation on delimitation insofar as it concerns the so-called tribal interpretation demonstrated six general characteristics. The first is that as it concerns the crucial date of 1905, it's based entirely on inference. However much Detective Sherlock Bourne, or it may be in the present context, Mr. President, Hercule Bourne, tried to stretch it. There is no smoke without fire, and there is no fire without a gnoc. There is no dung without cattle, and there's no cattle without gnoc, and so on. It's a new form of prima facie title. If you're in someone's presumptive area, any activity is presumed to be that someone, no matter how large the area. The second characteristic was a highly selective attitude to sources, with which is associated an unwillingness to, to actually address our real argument. On the latter point, they almost seem to have abandoned any claim to Area 1, which seems to have been given over wholly to the Twitch. One need only look at the article he discussed at length yesterday, one by scientists, he stressed, by Stubbs and Morrison regarding the, the Nyok agro-pastoral way of life. The opening sentence to the article reads as follows. The Western Dinkas, who now number some 140,000 persons living along the Lol, the Chell, the Pongo, and the Baral Arab, along, I stress, these four rivers paint a rough geographic box with the Baral Arab forming the northern side. And yet it suggested that a country the size of Belgium sits on top of them. A third remarkable fact for someone who believes as rigidly as Mr. Bourne does in the rules of English grammar, is a complete tone deafness to the critical date in this case. He purported to accept my characterization of the anthropological fact, although characteristically there is no sentence of Mr. Bourne that doesn't involve some twisting of the argument and he didn't accept the point I was making. But he said, yes, there's an anthropological fact and has discussed the entire case in what is known as the anthropological present. That is to say, on the assumption that all dates are compressed and that everything that, that is happening now is deemed always to have happened. Yet dates, and especially 1905, is crucial to this case. The fourth element of the tribal delimitation case is what I might describe as environmental determinism. It's not too much to say that he discussed the environment rather than the evidence. The environment was used to generate a presumption that everything that happened in a grossly extended area of the so-called bar was attributable to the knock in case of doubt. His fifth was a cartographical challenge 
The fifth characteristic is the continued cartographical challenge, amounting in some cases to incompetence, as is in his treatment of the Wilkinson map and route report to which I will come. And sixth, a pronounced tendency to miss the point. My anthropological fact, he said a very complicated question of fact, related only to the tribal definition. And I made that perfectly clear. In our view, if we're right on the territorial definition of the mandate, the question is not very difficult. Of course, there is still a question of delimitation. And in the view of delimitation put forward by Mr. Schofield, unless the delimitation is virtually already achieved, it's beyond the, the reach of a tribunal. But you understand that questions of delimitation that will involve a certain degree of difficulty. The degree of difficulty is by no means excessive in the context of the run of delimitation cases. My point was different. To determine the boundaries of the area transferred in 1905, if that means the boundaries of the area of the Nyok in 1905, is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. It's not a case, according to their position, simply of determining the outer edges of the Nyok in 1905 and then straightening the lines. It's a case of assuming that they extend to vast swathes of area. Area 4, the area north of the Rugabare Saga, I remind you, constitutes a majority of the ABC experts' area, 11,000 square kilometers. There is no extant definition of the GOS which would produce that result. I'll come back to each of these points. My first point of substance then is environmental determinism and the idea that you're allowed to give, as it were, to give the NYOC the benefit of the doubt whenever any doubt arises on environmental grounds. It's remarkable, and one of the features of this case is the way in which the SPLMA rely on their experts to say, to say things and to do things that their experts do not agree. We saw that this morning with community mapping as well. It's remarkable that Professor Allen, who answered questions entirely fairly and openly yesterday, accepted that he was not an environmental determinist. He said, and I quote, as a geographer, as part of my professional experience, Geographers learn that environmental determinism doesn't work. You can't say, well, that particular tract of, land, tract of land will lead to that particular livelihood. So I'm not suggesting that the Bar region determines anything or the Goz region determines anything. That's a perfectly fair statement. And yet that, of course, is precisely what the SPLMA Council did to determine that on the basis of an inflated definition uh, of the bar and of the goz, all the bar and half the goz belongs to the nyok on environmental grounds. The SPLMA's environmental claim is essentially based on two points. First, that because the nyok crop, Jura, is ideally suited to the bar region, they must live, necessarily have lived throughout the Bar region. The same argument is made with respect to the cattle being adapted to the Bar region's damp climate and terrain. Now, there is, of course, an important point here. We, do not, we, we accept entirely that the environment of the region does influence the, the, tra the movement patterns of the groups that live there, both with respect to the cattle of the Humra and the cattle uh, of the Nyok. But that doesn't mean, and it doesn't establish, that the Nyok are in any place in which Dura can be grown or their cattle can survive. And in particular, whatever may have happened since 1905, it doesn't establish that that was the case in 1905. There are all sorts of reasons why the Nyok may have been further to the south in 1905 than the environmental capacity of their main crop. Uh, and their main form of uh, livelihood, which was milk from cattle, would have sustained, including political factors. The Mardia itself, which forced them to, towards the south, and which also forced the Maseria towards the south, as we will see. Moreover, 
the whole area is much more variegated than the simplistic black and white picture presented of it by counsel for the SPLMA. Mr. Bourne cited an article by Governor Lloyd who said, and I quote, in the north the soil is reddish sand interspersed with tracks of sand and clay mixed. This gradually increases further south until the red sand disappears and black soil commences. South of latitude 10 degrees 30, black soil predominates. We entirely accept that that may be true as a matter of geographic fact. It doesn't determine where the Nyok were in 1905. It doesn't even begin to do that. What Mr. Bourne omitted to say yesterday was that he was citing from a 1907 Lloyd article some notes on the Dar Homer, in which Lloyd says Dar Homer, or the country of the Homer Arabs, is situated in the southwest corner of the province of Kordofan. If the ABC experts are right, it's not situated there anymore. With regard to the heralded black soil, Lloyd Rater writes, and I quote, the southern half of Kordofan, which included Dar Nuba, consists of black soil in the center of which rise the Nuba Mountains. The plains are inhabited by Cataloning Bagara Arabs and the mountains by numerous tribes of Nuba. He doesn't mention the Nyok. I accept that the Nyok lived also on black soil, but they didn't have a priority right to it. There were no patent rights of the Nyok in black soil. This is a sort of agricultural determinism. McMichael, the prolific Sudan scholar and former condominium governor, refers to the Homer living on black soil. It was not exclusive to the Nyok, nor was cultivation, as Lloyd equally points out. Nor does the environmental cattle argument sit comfortably with the assertion that the Nyok had permanent visits, vi villages as far north as 10 degrees 35. A large part of this area is the Goz, a sandy, waterless area. Nyok cattle do not move well in that area. Of course, the Nyok may move around it for various purposes, but the idea that they live there permanently is fantastic, and the idea that they should have to, that the Miseria should have to divide that area on a 50-50 basis because of somewhat different, only somewhat different lifestyles is equally fantastic. I turn to Professor Cunnison. He defines in paragraph six of his first witness statement, he defines the Bar as the riverine area around the Bar al-Arab and the Ragaba Zerga. That was his translation. There is, it is fair to say, a slight degree of imprecision in that, in that language. The reason is quite obvious that a Ragaba doesn't stop a soil type. If you're in an area of soil type and you come to uh, an important river channel or a channel of an important core, the chances are that soil patterns will continue at least for some period of time. But I remind you again that the area we're talking about is 11,000 square kilometers to the north of the Ragaba Saga. And the mere fact that some slight areas to the north of the Ragaba might have black soil doesn't establish, doesn't begin to establish Nyok ownership of those areas. You have to look at the actual documents which demonstrate where the Nyok were in 1905 to establish that. I have two other points on Cunniston, which I make incidentally in the context of this reply. The first point relates to his non-appearance here. Mr. Bourne suggested that we deliberately withheld him as a witness on the ground that his evidence was um, unfavorable to us. I've already had occasion to remark about the normal etiquette amongst, amongst legal professionals of not inferring bad faith in the context of their handling of a case. In fact, we specifically said why Professor Cunniston was not here in our letter to the Tribunal of 20 March 2009. We said, the government of Sudan is willing to make all of its witnesses available to attend the hearing. They didn't ask to see them all, except for Mr. Ian Cunniston who will be unable to attend due to his poor health. He was born in 1923. He's 86. Some octogenarians manage to travel to The Hague with considerable frequency. Some do not. 
The judgment that was made in consultation with his wife was that he was not well enough to travel. If the SPLMA had asked to talk to him, arrangements could have been made to do it, as we offered to do with the Vice President. They did not do so. I do not take kindly to the suggestion that I am engaged in the suppression of evidence. The second point relates to the suggestion made by counsel for the SPLMA that it, that it, except on one point which was put to Mr Cunnison by counsel for the government, Mr Cunnison agrees, Professor Cunnison agrees with their position. First of all, on the point that, was, that Mr Cunnison was told about, about the effect of the shared rights area, he makes it quite clear in his first witness statement this is something he's told. He expresses, unlike certain witnesses, expert witnesses for the SPLMA, he expresses no view on any legal issue. You can read his witness statements for yourself. He does, however, express a very important view about the concept of shared rights as he understands them. And he does this in paragraph 9 of his first witness statement. We've taken the view that we would not read out to you large slabs of witness statements and other material in the record, given the, the shortness of time. But since it is said that Professor Cunnison supports the SPLMA, I have no choice but to read the whole paragraph. He says, the GOS overlaps the so-called shared rights area of the ABC report. In describing that area in this way, it seems to me the ABC was fundamentally mistaken. I did not observe this. He refers to his two and a half years living in the region with the Hummer traveling down as far as the Bar al Arab. I did not observe this as an area of shared rights at all. Nor was the dividing line drawn by the ABC within that area in any way regarded as a boundary between the Hummer and Dinka. The Dinka were to the south, as I have said. Some Dinka sought employment in Muglad. It was not unknown for individual families to travel north and be, so to speak, adopted into one or another of the Amodias of the Hummer. They might also take surplus cattle north to market, but they did not exercise regular grazing or similar rights in the so-called shared rights area. The real area of sharing was further south, in the bar, as he defines it. There the two groups coexisted for a fairly short season, but this was not a host-guest relationship. For him it was the bar, the area to the south, which in the early 50s was the shared rights area, that bore no relationship to the reasoning which enabled the ABC experts to transfer 11,000 square kilometres of Cordofan to the SPLMA or the ABA area. And he said much the same thing in paragraph 3 of his second statement, which I will not read. I made the point yesterday that there is a, an extraordinary problem. Let's accept for the, for the sake of argument that the CIVSEC area is simply a description of where the Nyok are in the dry season. I'll come back to the Sivsec area in a little more detail later on, but the point is this. The Sivsec area of the Nyok represents 500 square miles. Is it seriously suggested that that group of Nyok, a rather small group in 1905, somehow exploded, assume for the sake of argument, that the purple area shown in the Sivsec map represented the area of the Nyok in 1905. We don't concede that, but let's assume it. Is it suggested that in 1905, without the trace of evidence except the odd wisp of smoke in the distance, the Nyok exploded from this 500 square miles to, a, to occupy 23,000 square kilometers? That is a fantastic suggestion, and there is no basis in the evidence for it. Council quoted Cole and Huntington, a modern uh, account based on field work in Abbey in the 1970s of agricultural patterns in the region. And they, Cole and Huntington shed light on the difficulties of the region and its extremely variegated character, which anyone who knows anything about the geography of riverine areas will find is not surprising. This is what they say at page 88 of their study, and I quote, First, it was generally assumed, they mean it was generally assumed before they began their study, that there was a huge amount of cultable land just waiting to be utilized with the available technology 
in the general area around Abbey. In part, this myth was fostered by the Northern Minister of Agriculture officials who compared the apparently fertile open lands of Abbey to the drier and sandier lands to the north. The supposed vast resources of land on the floodplains of western and southern Sudan were a myth under existing technologies, at least in the Abyei area and probably to a greater or lesser extent in the rest of the region as well. In fact, Willis and Wilkinson knew where the Nyok went in the wet season. They were more congregated together and at the time Willis and Wilkinson were writing, more or less immediately after tr the transfer, that was very much in the south. I turn to the second issue of cartographic incompetence. And here I want to deal in the first place with Wilkinson's report. There are three points. The first relates to the alleged Nyok villages of El Jat and Um Garen. Now it's fair to say, and one does try to be fair even under provocation, it's fair to say that counsel for the SPLMA accepted that this was an inference or a hypothesis. I have to say, when counsel for the SPLMA accepts that something is an inference, that's more or less, he, he would, on the other side, take that as a definite admission. His normal forensic mode is that of carpet bombing. So to suggest something is an inference is already to admit a high level of doubt. But curiously enough, there's not much doubt at all if you look at the document. This is, of course, taken from the volume two roots of the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. And it's the root report, which begins at page 151 of volume two, Major Wilkinson, the root report of January and February 1902. There are basically three stages to the route that Wilkinson took. There's the stage south, where he meets a river which he is told is the Bar al Arab, and then goes further south to see Sultan Rob. There's a short stage uh, uh, in, a, in a direction which we'll come back to, which is broadly northwest. And then he walks back on a somewhat different route. Um, to again to the river that he calls the Bar al Arab. Now the two small villages which Mr. Bourne said were Nyok villages on the Ragaba as Zaga are El Jat and Um Garen. And he said they were Nyok villages because they have the characteristic mode of there only being three or, three or four houses uh, in a rather separate area. It's not a wonderful example. This would be an architectural monopoly. No one else is allowed to have three houses in a small village. It has to be six or eight or some other number. If you look at how it's described, he talks about a series of settlements, and it's true that he mentions some being Arab settlements, but he's giving general descriptions. He refers to a few Homer Arabs living in various places. And while he's north of Fawal, so far as one can tell, the whole area up to now has been Arab. He says, Fula Hamadai with a little water sufficient to water animals dry on 9202. It's amazing how these administrators who didn't administer were concerned about the availability of water for the locals. He then says, small villages, mere collection of three or four huts passed at El Jat and Um Garen. And that is said to be an acknowledgement of the Nyok. Then he, talk, he refers to Fula Hamalai and a village named Foot. Well, these are villages. There's absolutely no evidence that they're Nyok villages at this time, and one would infer from the text of the report that they are not, because he goes on to say, after reaching Fawal with its large Arab settlements and crossing the Bar al Arab, he finds a Dinka, the, the road to a Dinka chief named Rueng, bearing in mind, of course, there are other Dinka in this area, that this is the Rueng. And then he says, the first Dinka village of Bombo is reached. According to council, that should have been the fourth or possibly the third Dinka village. When he said first, he meant first. That's what he said. 
There was no reason to refer to every clutch of a few houses at an earlier stage as being Arab for them to be Arab from the context, and there's no indication that they were not, in particular because they're described as the first Incas. And the first Incas he sees uh, are even later at a tie. It's pure supposition to suggest that bec because condominium officials didn't describe a clutch of huts north of Thawa, they're somehow presumed to belong to the Dinka, to the Nyok, I might say. We now come to the second phase of Wilkinson's journey after he leaves Sultan Rob. Mr. Bourne quoted the following extract and said, uh, and he did it in order to demonstrate that there was Nyok settlement well to the north of the Bar al-Arab in 1902. I interpolate to say, we don't deny that there was Nyok settlement to the north of the Bar al-Arab in 1902. We could not do so in light of the evidence. What we deny is that it reached anywhere near the Raghava Um Saga, and that is a crucial fact in this case. It's one which, since each party at this phase has to prove its own case, the onus is on the SPLMA to do it. Well, Mr. Bourne tried valiantly, I have to say, but everything he does is valiant, to prove the point. And he quoted the following passage. I quote, Leaving Sultan Rob's settlement, the road runs northwest, and the river is left on the left, but is struck again two and a half miles on, and the path keeps along the left bank. The country here is all open and much Dura cultivated. It is not in dispute that this country was not country. Dinka dwellings are dotted about and the country presents a most prosperous aspect. Even the quickest look at Wilkinson's map demonstrates that what he was doing was walking along the Bar el Arab. He crossed the Bar el Arab from Sultan Rob's village to the, on the south bank, then headed northwest along or close to the north bank of the river. He only turned away from the river at the village of Gohea, which he described as on the river bank. So, of course, he encountered Nyok villages and cultivation, but they were on the Bar al Arab, to the north of it, of course, but on it. Heading northeast and then north, the next three things he mentioned were the Regabat el Lao, a watercourse, El Niat, described by Wilkinson as a large swamp, now dry but referred to as Mr. M Mr. Bourne claimed it yesterday to be a Nyok village, and then Abu Karait, a Homa settlement. The inference is that where he's been talking about settlements of one particular group, and then comes upon a settlement of a, of a different tribe, he says it at that point, as he did on the way down. He does it on the way back when he comes to Abu Karait. The first sign of any human presence found by Wilkinson north of the real Bar Arab on this trip, on the return leg of his journey, was a Homa settlement. I make the point, incidentally, that it, that particular village, Abu Karait, if you look very carefully at the map, I'll leave it to your, your cartographical consultants to do so, is actually not on the Ragaba, the real Ragaba es Saga. It's on a tributary. It lies on the stream which runs into the Ragaba at Melum. In any event, our basic proposition is this. We have never said that there was a mistake of the whole course of the Ragaba es Zaga in or around 1905 for the Bar el Arab. There was not, for the perfectly good reason that the course of the Ragaba es Zaga in general was not known at the time. That was why it was possible for people like Wilkinson to mistake the Bar el Arab. They weren't looking for another river but I would draw your, the attention of your consultants to the fact that the river which is identified as the river on which Abu Karait lies, the Ragares Saga, is actually not the Ragares Saga, but a tributary of it. <coughs> Mr. Bourne called for detective work and scientific appreciation. Looking at a map would have been a good start. I would also refer to the concession, no, I'm sorry, I won't use that word. I will also refer to the response made by Professor Daly this morning to my question in relation to Percival's report. The tribunal will remember I asked him 
Where in Percival's report do you find an express reference to, uh, to Nyok's settlements on the Raghava S. Saga? Professor Daly said he couldn't find an express reference. It was simply his interpretation. I pause in this, what I have to accept is a slightly disconnected presentation. The tribunal will uh, forgive me for this, to make two other historical remarks. The first concerns the differential impact of the Mahdi. We've dealt with this in our pleadings, but it was trotted out in the last day, and it needs to be mentioned. The suggestion is that the Nyok were immune from the factors which, it is true, had a very material adverse impact on the Hummer during the Mahdi period, for reasons that we don't need to go into. But the suggestion that the Nyok were immune is without foundation for the reasons stated in our rejoinder. Professor Cunnison writes of this period, and he'd, he'd obviously looked at the history rather carefully himself, the tribe, he's referring to the Huma, in the end of the Mahdi period, lived among the riverbeds north of the Bar al Arab, that is, in the riverine area, and rebuilt their stocks of cattle by trading ivory they hunted for cattle from traders who established buying centers there. So they were well to the south at that time, hiding from the impact of the Mahdi uh, and the extremely disturbed conditions to which that had given rise. A second point in the immediately post-condominium period related to the government's concern about the river system. I would, simply, I would simply make the point in supplement to the questions that I asked Professor Daly that the Sudan intelligence report for November 1904 makes it clear that Bailden was beginning to investigate areas to the north. In February 1905, the, the month before the transfer, there was a report on Bailden's progress reproduced in the Sudan intelligence, intelligence reports which refers to the raids on Sultan Gokwai of the district of Toj. And says that the Camel Corps Company, now in Bayer or Ghazar, will investigate their case on the raid at way to Kordofan. Professor Daly presented this picture as one of complete absence of government administration. All I would say is read the documents for yourself. They may be colonial documents. They are colonial documents. What is clear, one doesn't like colonialism in principle, what is clear is that the coming of the condominium was an unqualified blessing for the people of the Sudan, including both the peoples primarily involved in this case. Professor Daly fully accepted my view that the population estimate given by the SPMA of 50,000 was wrong. He wasn't prepared to put his own estimate on it. We've given an estimate based upon his methodology of five to 10,000. Council distorted the, my statement, which was a slight modification of our earlier position by giving the number of 15,000, but didn't explain where that came from. The consequence was that it's obvious from the evidence that there was significant interest by the government in clarifying the river situation at precisely the time when the transfer occurred. And that incidentally, in the course of those projects, of those programs, there was something which is indistinguishable from administration. Can you imagine if you were counsel in my hypothetical case between the English, the British government and the French government for the delimitation of the boundary between a French bar of Gazal and an English Cordofan, how much you would leap on these documents with joy as evidence of administration. But you know that for yourself. I turn to the, Mr. Bourne did not refer to the majority of the root reports uh, and associated information which I took you through yesterday. He has a rather snotty and selective view about colonial administration, it seems. Instead, the primary basis on which the SPLMA constructs its case is the combination of its environmental argument, this form of environmental determinism, with oral history. 
I've already commented on oral, oral history. I don't deny its value in determining a general position. But it has to be checked against the other evidence. It's said that Sultan Rob, who was himself, of course, a direct actor in the event, was lying when he said there were no Nyok to the west of his settlement at Burakol. What we suggest is you look at the other evidence on that particular point. To take one example, what is the other evidence? The other evidence is the route report which someone walks from Gurinti, which is not a Nyok settlement and certainly was not a Nyok settlement in 1905, to Sultan, the, the new village to Burakol and finds no tracks and then says that on the Ragaba there are only Arabs traveling south to go to the village to, to buy grain. There's a concordance of evidence conforming what Sultan Rob, who may have lied on occasions, but doesn't seem to have been lying on this occasion. And there's much other evidence of the non-involvement of the Nyok on the Darfur boundary north of the Bar al Arab. But the principal new element above the oral history is the community mapping report. Now, one cannot deny the value of community mapping in certain contexts, but frankly, it's a case that the information gathered may be gathered in a more systematic way, but it can only be checked in a very careful manner. And we simply don't have the data, the data produced by the community mapping project. It was conducted in a hurry. You heard the circumstances in which it was conducted, but in particular you heard the concession by Dr. Poole when I asked him whether he accepted the SPLMA's representation of what he'd established. I'll quote it again from paragraph 51 of the rejoinder. The community mapping project shows permanent Nyok Dinka villages were located throughout the Bar region, extending north to latitude 10 degrees 35 minutes north both in 1905 and for decades thereafter. He obviously accepted under some pressure that that was not the case. It is a clear misrepresentation. The community mapping project can establish nothing except for the area in which it was, in which it was covered. And you can look at the outcome as to what you would, would think in relation to areas to the north of the Raghava as Saga. I come back to my point about hybrid boundaries, which I made yesterday and which Mr. which counsel for the SPLMA responded to rather briefly this afternoon. I will revert to some of the issues about the determination of the tribal area of the Nyok at 1905 in my final presentation tomorrow. But I do want to address this issue because it is of fundamental importance. When I was making a point about being geographically challenged, I was not making that point in relation to the hybrid issue. I was making the point in relation to rather more, let us say, trivial questions of whether their submission actually contained a complete area or not, and whether particular references to coordinates were geographically accurate. The broader point is this. If the SPLMA wants to live by the tribal boundary hypothesis, then they die by it as well. They can't pick and choose. They can't say, as they now seem to be saying, there were virtually no nyok in area one, the area below the, the Bar al Arab, and then say that as a matter of tribal interpretation, it belonged to the nyok. On the basis of the assumption that that area was virtually empty, it did not belong to the nyok. Apparently, it belonged to the Twitch, who accepted their being moved to the south in a boundary which Titherington showed was some considerable distance south of the river and which was coexistent with the boundary between the Nyok and the Twitch. The positions they're taking don't add up. They don't make sense. There is no actual evidence there on the Darfur boundary. Mr. Bourne says, and it's true, that the agreement to which one version of the CivSec document was attached, the reason we gave you two versions is that it was an annex to a the minutes of a meeting held in the 30s, which is one of those uh, uh, annex numbers that he mentioned. 
uh, but it obviously had a, it was brought into being for another purpose and was used in the context of a discussion about um, grazing rights for the Malwal Dinka south of the Bar al Arab uh, and south of the, uh, of the Darfur boundary. It's obvious that the Nyok had no interest in what was being discussed at that meeting, although the map itself was being used as an apparently valuable addition to the body of information about grazing rights in the general area. But the fact that they had no interest in it demonstrates the point, which is that they were not on the Darfur boundary at all, as the other evidence shows. If they're not on the Darfur boundary, then their own theory of the case means that this, the um, Abia area does not include an area so far to the west. And Sultan Rob was right in saying that, uh, more or less at the time of the transfer. You can determine the anthropological fact because that is your mandate in the context of the delimitation exercise. We say, of course, that it is an extraordinarily difficult fact to, to demonstrate, and I think the process of the last two days will have satisfied you of that proposition on which the Council do, in fact, agree. We say the fact of that is the reason why there was an excess of mandate in this case because the fact that was determined was actually a fact relating to provincial boundaries without the most crucial provincial boundary being taken into account at all. Mr. President, I think I've reached the period at which we are supposed to stop at this phase. We will do it but with, the, I hope, the assurance that if there's anything that I've left out in these rather scattered remarks, I can come back to it before Mr. Bourne has the last word tomorrow, afternoon, uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you, members of the Tribunal. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Crawford. Are there any questions from part of the tribunal? No. So we break until five.